Grateful to be here with you this morning. Uh, as Neil said, uh, I just really appreciate the Coastline family. Um, our church exists because you were faithful to sow into us. Even if you're going, hey, this is the first time I have heard your name or the first time I've heard the name of your church there in Fort Walton Beach, whether you know it or not, the Coastline family has played a part in the growing community of believers that are there. As we started back in 2013 with roughly about 20 people, and now we have uh, somewhere near 600 people that say that we're their church home. So it's really cool to see what the Lord has done, and your church has been a part of that, and so I really appreciate it. And I'm grateful to be here uh, and have the honor of sharing God's word with you this morning. Uh, I'll kind of knock this out of the way at the top. If you notice, I'm holding a pink Bible. Uh, that is, that's not because I'm trying to accessorize with my shoes, okay? Uh, it's not because I'm trying to be gender inclusive. Um, it is solely because as I looked for, I usually use a thin line ESV when I preach and when I was looking around the house this morning, I went, oh no, I left all of my ESV thin lines up at the church, uh, our church facility, and, but thank God for wives, uh, because my wife had a thin uh, ESV, it just happens to be pink, so I'll just get that out of the way. Uh, thank the Lord for wives, as I am using her Bible this morning. So we are in Galatians chapter 2. Uh, we'll be in verses 15 through 21. Predominantly, I'll spend uh, the time exegeting verses 17 through 21. Uh, we're going to talk about justification by faith and living for Christ. Justification by faith and living for Christ. Now, when we talk about justification by faith, um, I think uh, many of us uh, perhaps, perhaps as we try to define that, we, we kind of lean into really an understanding, which would be a correct understanding, uh, that through the work of Christ, and as we receive it by faith, uh, that we become right in God's eyes. That those that are wrong, he now looks at and he says, no, you're, you're right. That those that are unjust, now by reception of the grace of God, what was accomplished on the work of the cross, he looks at us and he says, you were, you, you were unjust and now you are just. Okay, so that's what it means to be justified, to be declared just in the eyes of God. Uh, perhaps, maybe even you've heard it put this way before, to be justified is to be just as if I had never sinned. Anyone heard that before? I've heard that. I've preached that. Uh, I, I don't think that's wrong. I, I just, the more I kind of think about it, it's kind of incomplete. And what I mean by incomplete is when we say it's just as if I never sinned, uh, we tend to kind of lean into the idea of forgiveness, which is, which is true. When we place our faith in Jesus, we're forgiven of our sins. We are, in essence, just as if I never sinned. But that kind of moves you to a uh, place of, you could say, neutrality, right? Okay, I, I was a sinner, and I've been forgiven, and so now I'm kind of sitting in this place of neutrality, almost like I get a do-over, almost as if God says, well, now you've been forgiven, and now work really good at being righteous, now you try to be a really great Christian now that you go to church and you have the Bible, uh, you need to go on mission trips and you need to read your Bible and you need to tithe and all the things that you got wrong before, now that you're a Christian, that's all wiped away and now you do it all right. But the beauty of the gospel is not just that we've been forgiven of our sins and moved to a place of neutrality, but when we accept Christ, we also have the righteousness of Jesus given to us. Amen. And that's a beautiful thing. In fact, I don't think the evangelical church talks about that quite enough. Not just forgiveness, but the, what Martin Luther called the imputed righteousness of Christ. Because when you really understand that, that, hey, not only are my sins forgiven, but I have the obedience of Jesus assigned to me. That's just mind-boggling. You could think of it this way. Uh, imagine kind of uh, uh, whether you want a, a banking illustration of some sort, money illustration. Uh, but imagine that because of sin, you have a debt that is so large that you could never pay that debt. If you had uh, 100 lifetimes you could never pay the debt that you owe. And somebody graciously comes, somebody that's extremely wealthy, and they pay your debt. 
Now, praise God for that. That's pretty awesome, right? Some of you are like, I wish somebody would do that. That's how I feel about my debt, my school loan, or whatever else. But imagine somebody comes and they pay off your debt. Now, you could say that moves you to a place of neutrality. Now, when you look at your bank account, you're not in the red. You just have a zero balance. But what the gospel says is not only did Jesus come and pay your sin debt, but Jesus also, when he paid your sin debt, he also gave you his righteousness. So it's as if that rich benefactor not just paid your debt, but then transferred all of their wealth into your bank account. So you not only look at your bank account and go, well, it's not just that I have a zero balance. I'm not, I don't have a debt anymore, but I also have untold wealth and my bank account. Who doesn't want that, right? But even more so than in a monetary value, that's what you've been given in Christ. You've been forgiven, and then the righteousness of Jesus clothes you. It's the beauty of the gospel. And then as the righteousness of Christ clothes you, and you understand justification by faith, that produces a new life in you. It's not a life that pays God back for what he did. It's not a life that says, I I've got to do over and I'll be better now. It's a life of worship and love. It's an authentic work of the Holy Spirit as he bears fruits of righteousness in your life. And so we're just going to talk some about this this morning, this justification by faith and then living for Christ. You're justified. Obedience has happened. And now just live for Christ. Enjoy Christ. Uh, let's read here in verses 15 through 17. I'm not going to spend a lot of time exegeting these, but uh, they really kind of highlight the main theme of the book of Galatians, which is justification by faith. Here the Apostle Paul says, We ourselves are Jews by birth, and we are not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Really, if you had to sum up the book of Galatians like that, that would be it right there. Those two verses. I know you're at a good Bible teaching church, and uh, when you're at a good Bible teaching church, they also just teach you how to exegete the Word. And one of the ways that you learn how to understand what God's Word is saying is you exegete by looking for redundant words. That helps, right? If you see a word repeated multiple times, you're like, there's probably something in that. And here in two verses, we have justification three times. If you go back and count them, three times we're told there's this justification in Christ. Not only forgiveness, but imputed righteousness is given to the believer. So there's justification three times. Then three times it also says, it's not of your works. You can't do it. You can't be good enough. You can never be perfectly obedient to God. You can never be righteous enough to stand in the presence of a holy God. And so your works, Jewish works, Christian works that you may try to do to accomplish your righteousness, they will not work. Works don't work. So justification, and then he says three times, not by works of the law, and then he says three times, it's only by faith. Faith in Christ, the one who was perfectly obedient, the one who is perfectly righteous. That's the only way by faith, or the ESV says belief too, but that's kind of the same interchangeable, faith and belief. And then here as we move into verse 17, what I want us to look at uh, to start off with is we're going to look at there's this charge of license, okay? Uh, license, uh, there, there are two, you could say there are two um, deviations from the gospel. Uh, in our hearts, we kind of deviate from these uh, on a daily basis, and we have to be brought back to the gospel. Uh, you could say that even when uh, they become full-blown heresies, like not something just in our heart that we struggle with, but something we actually begin to proclaim, you could say there's really two uh, heresies the church has always dealt with. Uh, what falls into one of two categories. One is either license. Uh, license means that uh, grace means I can do whatever I want now. Uh, Paul calls this a perverted kind of grace. Hey, I got grace and now I can just sin and do whatever I want. And it doesn't need to bring any life transformation because everything's fine now. 
And Paul talks about this and he says, well, hey, because when we sin, grace abounds to us, but that doesn't mean that we sin more, so more grace will abound to us. Hey, let's really glorify Jesus by sinning a lot around here, because if we sin a lot, then we get lots of grace, and then he's glorified in that. No, don't do that, right? If you're thinking that this morning, no. So there's this idea of license, and then another deviation from the gospel would be legalism, and that's largely where the book of Galatians uh, is born out of are false teachers inside the churches in the region of Galatia who are preaching legalism. Legalism's not like license. License says, hey, God's grace means you can just do whatever you want, okay? Uh, You know, just the carpe diem kind of YOLO kind of thing, all right? You know, as Christians, we don't hold to carpe diem. We don't hold to YOLO like that. That's not the way that it works. We have a life that is transformed by grace, justification by faith, and then a, a life lived for Christ. But then there's also the legalism that says, hey, it's Jesus and. It's, it's Jesus and what he did on the cross. And then you got you to gotta do some really good works, though. You can't be saved just based on justification. I mean, it's almost like Jesus drives it down to the one yard line for you. And now your righteous works punch it into the end zone so that you're saved. That's also a false teaching. License and legalism. Here's, look at it with me. You'll see the accusation of license from the false teachers in verse 17. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. Okay, uh, the false teachers we kind of understand their role in this in the book of Galatians. Uh, they're making an accusation against the apostle Paul as he preaches a justification that comes by faith. They basically say, uh, "No, that kind of message won't work. You can't preach justification. You're made righteous in Christ alone um, because here you are proclaiming that, and now you're not doing all the good Jewish works anymore." In fact, you're eating with Gentile sinners, and you can't do that. And you're not keeping all the dietary regulations. You know, to really be faithful in God's eyes, believe in Jesus, but keep all the dietary regulations. Make sure that those Gentiles get circumcised. they got to do that. They can believe in Jesus, but they also have to be circumcised, or they're not righteous in the eyes of God. And so ultimately what they do is they say, hey, you're not righteous, Paul, in this message of righteousness in Christ that you're preaching and it's by faith. You're not righteous anymore because we see the way that you're living. Not only are you not righteous, but now the people that you're preaching to, they're not righteous either because they're following you in the same kind of sins. And so when you preach this kind of sinner's message of righteousness in Christ, you lead people to sin, and therefore you make Christ a servant of sin. And he says, certainly not. That's not the way this thing works. Justification by faith does not mean that now, okay, well, everybody just sins. Certainly not. But it is an accusation. I'll just tell you this as a preacher who leans heavily into justification by faith in Christ alone, that the only way that I'll stand before a holy God is through the obedience of Jesus, not through my personal works of piety. But when you preach that, I guarantee you will have people that start going, I just don't feel comfortable with that. That sounds like license. You're not preaching license, but that's what they hear. It's, a, it's kind of a spirit of legalism that starts to just creep in. In fact, there might be some that are here this morning that all of a sudden as I'm preaching, you are made righteous based on the work of Jesus. You're like, I'm just not really comfortable with that. And it's just kind of this spirit of legalism that starts creeping up and it starts going, no, you're just, you're one of those licensed guys. You're one of those preachers, and I'm going to tell Pastor John and Pastor Neil that you can't come back and preach again. I won't remember your name, but I'll just say, hey, that guy that preached with the pink Bible, don't (laughs) let him back again. But it brings me comfort to know that many preachers of justification by faith have faced this accusation of license. Even John Bunyan, the Puritan author, pastor, he faced this. People came to him and they said, you can't preach that people are justified just in Christ alone. Because if you do that, people have no reason to be obedient anymore. You got to, yeah, tell them about Jesus and what he's done, but you also got to tell them to be really obedient. If you just preach justification in Christ by faith and act of grace, people will just sin. And here was his response. I love this. 
if people really see that Christ's righteousness has been given to them entirely as a gift, they will do whatever he wants. You see, okay, I know this is kind of this is kind of subtle, so let me just try it for a second to kind of unpack this. Legalism says you can't just preach justification in Jesus because then people will have no reason to act righteously anymore. They'll just do whatever they want. So you better hang some things over their head. You better tell them that their salvation is in doubt, and you better tell them that they might not make it. And and yes, they got a do over, but they better do better with their do over. You got to give them a reason to be righteous. And obedient. And John Bunyan says, I don't think you understand the way that the gospel works. The gospel works by saying, you'll never be obedient enough. Even if you strive to be obedient, you'll never be perfectly obedient. And so you better be leaning on some other type of good news outside of your own efforts. You better grab hold of the obedience of Christ. And he says, when an individual understands that their true righteousness is imputed to them, not only sins forgiven, but the righteousness of Jesus is given to them too. When they really understand that, and they really understand grace, that kind of person will do whatever God wants. But that kind of person doesn't do whatever God wants because, well, I got to pay him back or I got to do over. That person says, the good news is more glorious than I could have ever imagined. Really? I'm assigned the obedience of Jesus? And every day we wake up going, I cannot believe that that is the way that God sees me. That is truly gospel. That is truly good news. And as you start to understand that work of justification, your heart is endeared towards God. And now you're not serving him out of duty. You're not trying to pay him back for something that he has done for you. You're just saying, I love this guy. I love Jesus. And in fact, as one who walks with Christ, I still see my daily deficiencies. And I love justification in Christ even more. And I fall in love with Jesus even more. And now I want to serve him even more, not because I need to accomplish a work of righteousness, but because he's done it all for me. And it just becomes this love relationship. And it becomes worship. It becomes him working out the good work that he began in me. It becomes allowing the Holy Spirit to work in my life and taking steps of faith and allowing God to do what He does, which is birth fruits of righteousness in my life that I can't take credit for. But it's what He does from the beginning to the end. So to start off with, there's a charge of license. And then notice, though, that this comes out of the spirit of legalism, the legalism of the false teachers. It's here in verse 18. He says, for if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Uh, what he's doing is he's uh, flipping their argument back on them. He's saying, you're saying that I'm the transgressor because I'm saying that, hey, all your dietary regulations and circumcision won't get you there. It's only what Christ has done. It's 100% what Christ has done, or it's not. That's the only way that it works. And so they're saying, you're the sinner. And he says, no, actually, you're the sinner. He says, because you're trying to rebuild the law. Because here we are for hundreds of years, and David and Moses and Abraham and Elijah and all of these individuals who might love God and seek to honor God and walk with God, none of them were perfect. All of them fell short. I mean, you think about David, King David, right? He hides God's word in his heart that he might not sin against God. Well, I don't know. He must not have hid the part about adultery and murder, right? Did, did you not? Hide? No, no. I mean, he hid it in his heart. He knew what God's word said. He just couldn't perfectly keep what God's word had said. And so every hero, Old Testament that we see, uh, a man, woman, Every one of them, they fall short in some capacity or another. And it's only Jesus who is perfectly obedient. And so he says, when you go back and try to reestablish the law and you try to get back on the hamster wheel of works, you're the one who's actually the sinner because just like the perfect holy law of God declared you a sinner before, it'll declare you a sinner again. 
And so stop trying to make your righteousness about your works. So ultimately, he flips the argument back on them, and he says, no, you're the transgressor because we died to the law. Jesus brought an end to that. And now you're trying to rebuild that same law, works-based living again, which only confirms your transgression. You see, that's what legalism does. It tries to rebuild the law. It might not necessarily be circumcision or dietary regulations. It it might be kind of the the Christian 2.0 version that I'm trying to rebuild it through a perfect uh, uh, church attendance, through perfect small group attendance, through perfectly given 10%, through perfectly uh, going on a mission trip every time, through uh, uh, going to Bible college, getting some type of a position inside of a church, uh, Uh, the way that I think. I'll never have another lustful thought. And so I'll accomplish it that way through perfect mental purity. And so we kind of put all these steps out there. And those can be good things that the Word of God encourages us towards, but we can't rebuild the law. Our justification is in Christ. Everything else is worship. It's steps of faith, responding to the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, there are two errors in legalism. Okay, two, two of the heirs of legalism. One is this. Uh, legalism takes credit for the obedience of Christ. Okay? Legal, legalism seeks to take credit for the obedience of Christ. Uh, you could say it, it this way. It tries to take what's called uh, active righteousness and pull it into the category of passive righteousness. Okay, I'll unpack those two words a few months ago when I preached about active and passive righteousness at Gathering Church. I had some people come up to me afterwards like, you need to write that down. You know, uh, passive righteousness and active righteousness. Did you come up with that? And I'm like, I wish I could say that I did, but I didn't. Scholars have used those terms for a while. Okay, active and passive righteousness. So what passive righteousness is, passive righteousness is a righteousness, it's the righteousness that justifies you. Uh, You receive it by faith. It's an act of grace. It's what will allow you to be in the presence of a holy God for all eternity. It's a, a passive righteousness. You just receive it. You can't earn it. You can't do it. You just receive it. You could think of it in terms of it's a a vertical righteousness, okay? It's the relationship with God. God does for you what you cannot do for yourself. And so you receive it. If you would think of it uh, almost in a sense, this active and passive nature being like uh, if you went out to throw the football later on today with somebody, just a game of catch, there would be an active party and a passive party. The active party is throwing the football, right? And the passive party is catching the football, And so justification by faith in Christ says that we just catch what Jesus has done. And we by faith go, you know what? I'll never be able to do it perfectly. And I might not even look in the mirror and see myself as righteous. But by faith, I receive that Jesus has made me righteous. Regardless of what my feelings tell me, regardless of what people around me tell me, I am perfectly obedient and righteous because of the work of Jesus, and I receive it by faith. I'm passive in it. And then there's the fruit of passive righteousness, which is called active righteousness. It's the one that's horizontal in nature. It concerns your neighbor or your wife or your children or the other members of your church or your pastor. It's the fruit of passive righteousness. It's how you live towards them, how you love them, how you serve them, how you bless them. You are not saved based on your act of righteousness. In fact, it was your attempts at act of righteousness that led to your condemnation. So you are only saved based on your passive righteousness. But as John Bunyan said, when you really understand passive righteousness, it changes you and it leads to active righteousness. But what legalism does, it tries to take the act of righteousness and drag it into the category of passive righteousness so that you start thinking, well, I'm kind of saved because I go to church and I'm at a good church. I'm not like at some of these other churches. I'm at a Bible believing church. I'm at a church that exegetes the word. We walk through the scriptures book by book, verse by verse. I'm one of those serious Christians, unlike those other unserious Christians that are out there. It starts to drag what is 
active righteousness into the category of passive righteousness, and we start to think in our hearts that we're the ones who are doing it. We wouldn't say that with our mouths, but our hearts, that's what we believe. It's kind of like uh, in, in our particular area in Fort Walton, around uh, the church location that we're at right now, around the building, there's a lot of vagrancy uh, and there's a homeless population there. And, uh, and so out on the street there on Beale, we're on the corner of Hughes and Beale and there's a stoplight and that, I, I guess that tends to be one of the more lucrative places for panhandlers in Fort Walden Beach. So some of the homeless people go out there and panhandle and I, I've gotten to know most of them over time and, uh, and know their street names and all that kind of stuff and we become friends and uh, one of them, his name is Sarge and he's been out there for at least two or three years now. And not long ago, I was having a conversation with Sarge, and uh, he, said, he said, I work hard for my money. He said, I, I, I earn my money. And, and I'm like, did you, did you get a job? Like, I, is, I, I, I know you're usually out on the street corner panhandling. He said, yeah, I work hard for my money. It's hot out here. And I got to hold a sign and I got to do all this and trying in a, in a way of humility and still building a bridge to him and, and know that we've got, you know, a prior established relationship. And I'm like, Sarge, like, I, I love you, but I don't think that qualifies as earning your money standing on the street corner and panhandling. I, I think somebody else earned that money. Like, and they're giving it to you as an act of mercy and grace. And your disposition should be, I'm receiving this as an act of grace. Somebody else earned this money. They have mercy on me and they're giving it to me. I'm not saying don't receive it if it's given to you, but I am saying don't turn it into your personal work as though you earned that gift. And that kind of makes sense for most of us. Like, you're like, yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you, Pastor Ryan. But how often in our hearts do we become like Sarge when it comes to even our salvation? We, you, you don't really understand. I mean, I've been going to church for a long time, and I, I understand big theological words like justification. I could have told you all that stuff. Active and passive righteousness. Was aware of it. Read the, read the theology book before you were alive, Ryan. And so, you know, I, I got all this stuff. And have you, have you met my family? I mean, my family, they're beautiful. They're perfect. They don't make mistakes. I mean, sure, some small mistakes, but they're great. My kids are great. My, my kids, they're not like those other families that have have kids uh, that some of their kids are, are alcoholics and some of their kids struggle with drugs and some of their kids have premarital sex and you ought to see my family they're not like that you know why because I, I read the bible and and i do the bible and and i've been to the parenting camps and i I'm, i do podcasts online and i've got all this stuff down you see how our hearts try to take any form of active righteousness and drag it into the category of passive righteousness, and we become like Sarge. We wouldn't say it with our mouths, but in our hearts, we're like, I earned what I got. And God would say, no, you didn't earn what you got. It's an act of grace. That's, that's what makes it grace. But that's what legalism does. It takes credit for the obedience of Christ. It tries to say, you know what? It's not what Jesus did in justifying me. That's great, but I work really hard at this, and that's why I'm better than others, and that's why I'm worthy of God's grace, which is not grace anymore, is it? If you're worthy, you make yourself worthy of God's grace. Another error when it comes to legalism is not just that it takes credit for the obedience of Christ, but it tries to accomplish the obedience of Christ too. It kind of gets back and rebuilds the law and it gets on this hamster wheel. I, I, I promise, God, I'll get it right this time. I promise I'll be worthy to be in your presence. I promise it, it starts to live as an orphan and not a son and a daughter. And I'll tell you, that's a miserable kind of Christianity when you just kind of have an orphan mentality that's like, I'm not sure if I'm going to get adopted or not. And so let me strive really good to make sure I got a place in the household instead of knowing, no, in justification by faith, you are a son and you are a daughter. Your place in the household of God is secure. And just rest in that and know that. But legalism says, no, rebuild the law and you need to yourself accomplish now the obedience of Christ. I think about it this way. When I was a, a kid, uh, we'd play this basketball game called horse. 
Okay, it's a shooting game. Some of you are familiar. Uh, if you're not, uh, I'll, I'll just kind of tell you the rules of the game real quick. But it's a shooting game. Uh, imagine that there's two people playing the game of force. Uh, and so imagine that you're the one who gets to come up and take the first shot. You get to shoot whatever you want, like three-pointer, layup. You could throw it between your legs, whatever you want to do. And if you make your shot, then the next person has to come and they have to shoot the shot that you took and they have to make it. Okay, same exact shot you took. They have to duplicate it. And if they make the shot, well, then they don't get a letter. If they miss the shot, then they get a letter. They get the letter H. That's why it starts out, you know, as horse and you go through all the letters. Or if you're both really bad shots, you go with something like pig because it's shorter. You got to reduce horse down to pig. But you kind of play this game. And so one person's trying to make their shot. Then the other person, if they make it, they've got to make the shot. If not, they get a letter. And it kind of goes till the end where somebody uh, eventually has all five letters of horse and they lost the game, which means they, they just missed too many shots. And we can fall into this kind of trap, even when we, in our hearts, maybe not uh, uh, verbally, but in our hearts, we kind of fall into this uh, forgetfulness towards uh, justification by faith, and we start trying to live legalistically. We start kind of seeing the, all of the, the imperatives in the Scripture, okay? All the do's and the don'ts in the first five books of the Bible, there's like 300 of them something, not just the Ten Commandments, but even in the first five books of the Bible, like 300 plus do's and don'ts. And we start just kind of reading our Bible and we, we fixate on the do's and the don'ts and it becomes kind of like this game of horse in which every day we get up, we read our Bible and, and we're like, we're looking at the perfect will of God and the perfect will of God, even if you just took the Ten Commandments, says something like, don't have another God before me. And we're like, okay, today, don't have another God before him. You know, we try to make the shot and, and then we'll don't have any graven images. Okay. I don't have any graven images. You know, I made sure that picture of Jesus, in my house, I got it out of there, you know? Okay. So I'm making the shot and then, okay, well, uh, 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 don't take the Lord's name in vain or honor your mother and father or don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't commit murder. Right. And we're stepping up to the line. Okay. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it right. And then, of course, Jesus comes in the New Testament. And he says things like, well, if you've looked at a woman with lust, then you've committed adultery in your heart. It's like, what? <laughs> Who makes that shot? If you've been angry towards somebody, you've murdered them in your heart. Like, what? And so, but we just kind of do life and our approach, even our faith is, can I make the shot? Can I make the shot? Can I make the shot? But what we don't realize is that Jesus came to remove all of that. He came to give us the perfect obedience that he earned. In fact, in Philippians chapter 2, it says that Jesus was obedient to the point of death on a cross. What that means is like he played the game of righteousness horse and he made every shot. All the 300 something in the Old Testament, he got them all right. Even in his heart, even not lusting, not having anger towards somebody, not wanting to murder them in his heart. I mean, he did them all right. Jesus says that he only said what the Father said, and he only did what the Father did. I mean, that's some obedience, is it not? I wish even as a pastor, I, I wish I could say that everything I said is exactly what the Father said, or everything that I did is exactly what he did. But you can ask my wife, that's not true, right? But, but Jesus, he was perfect. He was perfect to the point of death on a cross. In a sense, you could say that was like the final shot, Will you be obedient to death on the cross? And Jesus just steps up and he nails it. And it's like game over. What, what do we do now? Jesus didn't miss anything. And what he's saying is this game of holy horse for righteous, like it's done with. I'm making a new way. And the new way is through faith and reception of the righteousness that I give people. That's the way that it works now. And that does deserve an amen. That's the good news of the gospel, right? I don't care how long you've been a believer. That, I mean, that's gloriously good news. It should never get to the point where we just go, I got that. That was kind of unimpressive. This preacher just told me things that I already knew. Okay. And then here, when we understand this idea that really it's what Christ is, it's not legalism, it's not us trying to rebuild the law. We, we don't need to take credit for what we have in Christ we can confess that the only way that we're saved is through grace, and it's what he does for us. That's the only way we'll stand before a holy God is through passive righteousness. We don't have to, in our hearts, try to drag over our righteous works and make it our standing. 
We don't have to get on the hamster wheel of works again and, and try to make ourselves acceptable to God. That that's like out of the picture. And some of you, you're going, well, if that's out of the picture, then what's left? People are going to sin. You're, see, you're the licensed preacher. You said it earlier, now I'm agreeing with you. You're the licensed preacher. You removed all ambition for people to be holy. But like John Bunyan, the Apostle Paul agrees, he says, no, when you really get justification by faith, it changes everything. It doesn't put you on the hamster wheel of works anymore. The obedience of Christ has taken care of that. But now God says, just live for me. You've been made righteous. Now just live for me. In fact, some of you here today, you just need to hear that. If you have placed your faith in Christ, you have been made righteous. Stop trying to do the works list receive what Christ has done for you. Believe it by faith and now love him and live for him. Where is that in the text? Well, I'm glad you asked. Verse 19 through 21. Here's how the Apostle Paul explains it. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I died to the law, guys. Now I live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. Imagine that. I mean, that's a pretty powerful statement. I can really imagine the Apostle Paul leaning into these false teachers and saying, I do not nullify the grace of God. Not for one moment. Stop talking circumcision, uh, dietary regulations. We're not nullifying the grace of God around here. It is justification by faith in Jesus. No nullifying the grace of God. But when you make it your works, I mean, it's not grace anymore. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. He's saying, well, why, if it was just that all of a sudden he came to give us some more teaching, I mean, Jesus did give us teaching, but we had a lot of old teaching in the Old Testament. The problem was not a failure in the teaching. The problem was there was no way to accomplish the righteous commands of God. That was the issue. What you needed was not just a, a rabbi. Jesus was a rabbi, but you needed a savior. And so that's why Jesus came. So are you just going to go back and do works of the law again? No, don't nullify the grace of God. If you were good enough, why did Jesus come? If you could be righteous enough on your own, why did Jesus come? Jesus came because you couldn't do it, Amen. but he did it for you. And you merely, by faith, you receive it. Not what your feelings say, not what the people around you say, not what your past says. By faith, I am made righteous based on the work of Jesus. I dare not nullify the grace of God. And I'll tell you what, this living for Christ, just two beautiful uh, aspects to this, really understanding justification by faith and now how it changes my heart and it changes my worship and I, I want to live for him now. Okay, two beautiful aspects of this. One is this, it becomes about a life of faith, not a hamster wheel of works. It's just a life, a life of faith. It's interesting in uh, John chapter 6, I, I don't have time to turn there, but in John chapter 6 around verse 25, some people come to Jesus and they say, what must we be doing to do the works of God? And he says, you believe in the one the Father sent. Now, think about that. It's one of those things you could just pass over really easy. They're saying, what must we do to be righteous? What must we do to be doing the works of God? And he doesn't answer them and saying, here is the works that you must be doing. He says, the work is to believe. See, you see the difference. They say, where are the works? And he says, faith. And they're kind of confused in that. And many of us, probably even some this morning, you're still confused in that. Well, I mean, that's why I came to church. What's the work? And I'm saying, I, I can't give you a work. The work is believe in what Jesus has done for you. And then it... it, it inaugurates this life now of just saying, it's all by faith. My salvation is by faith. And, and now the, the law has been accomplished. The obedience of Christ has been assigned to me. And now I, I'm just, God wants me to interact with him by faith, by faith on a daily basis. My salvation is secure. Walk with him by faith. I have a friend and a mentor, and uh, he says, I, I, I wish that every day in my mailbox, I could just go out every morning and in my mailbox would be a list of the things that I needed to do for God that day. 
He's like, I, I feel like in my fleshly legalistic nature, that'd be really easy. I could go out to my mailbox. Here would be all the things that I need to do today. And I could do them all, check them off and go, I know that I am righteous now. I have satisfied for today God's responsibilities for me. I've been obedient. And he says, but God doesn't work that way because God doesn't say, here's the work. God just says, believe, have faith. So the work of God is not what must I do today. The work of God is, will you believe that he's faithful? Will you believe that he's gracious? Will you believe that he holds on to your salvation? Uh, will you believe that you can't change yourself, but he can change you? Will you believe that he cares about your family more than you care about your family? Will you believe that your job doesn't provide for you, but that God provides for you? Will you believe that God is a healer? Will you believe that God is a restorer in the life of your family? So what God is saying, he's saying, I'm not asking you really to do anything. I'm just asking you to believe today. Now, the fruit of belief is obedience, but it's not about the obedience. It's about the faith. That's what's at the root because the obedience in essence has already been accomplished. So God's just saying, hey, it's about faith today. And so if you're coming here going, what's the work I must do? I just say, what is God asking you to believe today? When it comes to you, when it comes to your marriage, when it comes to your kids, when it comes to being involved at a church, I can't do that. I don't have the time. But yet the Holy Spirit's saying, no, I want you to be a part of this. It's not the work. It's the faith of saying, I'll trust you, Lord. I'll believe that you'll give me the time back. I believe that you will allow the rest of my life not to fall apart if I serve at the church. I, I believe, like whatever, just believe. The step of faith is believe. And then I'll, I'll end with this. Just another beautiful aspect of understanding a life lived for Christ in light of justification by faith. It's a life of joy and peace. Okay? It changes your walk with God when you realize the obedience has been accomplished and He just wants you to respond by faith. It, it becomes a life that's just flooded with joy and peace because you're no longer standing there trying to dribble the basketball saying, can I make it today? Can I make the shot? You go, Jesus already made the shot. That part is secure. I started playing tennis when I was like 12 or 13, and, and I played a couple years in college. I mean, I, I played a lot. And one of my Achilles heels in playing tennis is that I'm just kind of an insecure guy. And uh, just being transparent, I'm kind of, I know some of you are like, I'm hearing you preach. You don't sound insecure. I'm just going to tell you, I am insecure. This makes me nervous as all get out. Like I, I, like I am. I'm just, I'm an insecure guy. And so I'm always worried about what I'm going to do wrong. And so even when I played tennis, like I just sit there, I shouldn't have picked that shot. Well, I should have moved my feet better. I, you know, all I do is I just sit there and focus on everything that I did wrong. And it's funny because in, I do this even as an adult now. And I, I get to the end and I go, why did I even play tennis today? I'm just miserable. I'm angry. I'm upset. All I see is all the things that I missed. But the funny thing is sometimes I'll, I'll play a match, whether it's USTA or something, and, and when the match is over, we'll, we'll say that myself or my doubles partner, we won, okay? So it's just an illustration. I'll say that we won. But, but after it's over with, sometimes the, the other guys will go, well, let's just play another set for fun. And the funny thing is now because the, like the first set uh, is all done, the real match is over with. The funny thing is when I play this set for fun, I play better. Why? Because I'm not worried about messing up. I'm not worried about losing. I'm just enjoying it. It doesn't mean that I don't try to win. It doesn't mean that I don't try to move my feet and think about the shot that I hit. But now the balance, the, uh, the balance of winning and losing, it's gone. And I really enjoy it. And I have a lot of fun. And I actually play better. And I would say that's even a, just a metaphor for the Christian life. When you understand that Jesus, he's won it for you. He's done the obedience. He's done the justification. And now you just get to enjoy him by faith. All the pressure comes off and there's peace and there's joy. And the funny thing is when you really learn to rest in the passive righteousness, the beautiful thing is you'll have more active righteousness show up in your life than you ever imagined. And you'll go, I didn't do that. That was him. Glory be to him forever and ever. Amen.